Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, our reading of God's word this Christmas morning comes to us from the gospel according to Matthew. The gospel according to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I'd invite you to open up your Bibles and to join with me in the reading of God's word. And I would invite you to keep your Bibles open as we consider this Christmas passage on this Christmas morning. Once more, the reading of God's word is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And I would remind you that this is God's own holy word written for you. Grant your full attention to it. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then, being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray for the reading of God's word. Our great God and Father in heaven, we rejoice before you on this Christmas morning. Lord, as we have been considering your word over the season of Advent, our hearts have felt that same aching longing that your people Israel have felt uh, throughout the many days since the promise was first made to Adam to that day in which it was fulfilled in the birth of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we, your new covenant church, rejoice in living in the days after the cross, we too longingly look forward to the day in which our Savior, Jesus Christ, will appear even as he ascended into heaven, coming from the clouds to gather us together into his kingdom, where his kingdom and his government and peace will have no end. We pray that this day we might worship our Savior. Assist us to worship you, O oh great God, for this wonderful mission of rescue that you have accomplished in the promised Son. And Lord, we do pray that we would also longingly await and pray with your church of old, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We ask all things in his name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in the Lord Jesus Christ, Merry Christmas to you all. And dare I say, Rejoice, rejoice, O Church of Christ, for Emmanuel has come to you, O Israel. For us and for our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ is born to you on Christmas morning. And as we have been preparing ourselves for these glad tidings of great joy announced by the angel this happy morning, we have been following God's people on a journey, searching for the Son throughout redemptive history. Last Lord's Day, we saw the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, as the fulfillment of God's prophecy. God's promise from the earliest days of history all find their fulfillment here in the birth of Jesus Christ. At the manger, we are standing at the very center of history. And now, this Christmas morning, we come to a very famous, uh, a very well-known part of the Christmas story, one that is typically known as the visit of the three wise men. This story is one that has captured uh, the imagination for many years. It's worked its way into songs that we sing. 
It's worked its way into uh, the imagery that decorates Christmas cards. It's worked its way into the imagery of much of our Christmas decorations. But yet, as much as it has captured the imagination, and as much as that is a good thing, sadly, it has also resulted in this story being told somewhat falsely. Songs that commemorate this event sometimes sing of three kings. However, there is nothing in this text to indicate to us at all whatsoever that these men were kings. In fact, there is nothing in this text to indicate to us at all whatsoever that they numbered in three. We do not know if these wise men came in three, in two, or in twenty. The three, gift, three gifts are given to Jesus, and so it is imagined that it came from three men, but the text does not, in fact, tell us this explicitly at all. But this passage is beautiful. And this passage is wonderful for us this morning, not because of the details that it may contain about wise men or how it may affect songs that we sing, but because of what it teaches us about Christ and what it teaches us about God's mission through him. This story is a challenge to us, but this story is also a tremendous comfort to us. It is a challenge because we see that it was not the religious leaders of Jerusalem who recognized the birth of Christ. But rather, it was this group of Gentiles from the East. And as we look at these wise men, we will see how they were the least likely to be the first worshipers of Christ. Those who did have God's word failed to read it properly. And therein lies a challenge for the New Covenant Church as well. But this passage is a comfort because it proclaims what the ministry of Jesus will be here, right at his birth. That he is born to be our king, symbolized by that gold. That he is born to be our priest, imaged by that frankincense. And that he is also born to be our sacrifice, as we will see imaged in the myrrh. That he is the one sent by God to make a church out of every tribe, out of every tongue, out of every nation. That he is a savior who will go into the depths of darkness to bring the least likely worshipers into his own marvelous light. Even from the most unlikely of places, the places that seem to be the most hostile to the truth, this Christmas morning, God himself is drawing worshipers to the feet of Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to see that in Christ, God has given to us the very greatest of gifts, and so we too bring our gifts to him. We'll see this in three ways. We're going to look at the arrival of the wise men, and then we're going to see the response of the king, and, and in the response of the king, really the response of the church. And then finally, we'll conclude with that scene of the giving of gifts. Let us look at our first point this morning, the arrival of the wise men. Let's read again verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. We know that Jesus is born in Bethlehem, and we are told here that this happens during a time in history in, when, in which the nation of Israel is governed under the king, Herod. And so during this time, as Herod is king, Jesus is born, in our story, wise men travel from the east and come into Jerusalem. Now we've already noted that there's a lot that popular tradition gets wrong about these wise men, so we should ask ourselves at the beginning of this text, who were they? Who were these wise men? What role did they function in our story? Well, the ESV and many other English translations simply give them this title, wise men. But this reading can be a little bit too soft of a translation. We can mistakenly think that these just so happen to be men from the East who were themselves wise. Or perhaps we might think of them as some kind of an ancient scholar. But that misses the mark a little. You see, the word used to describe them isn't actually an adjective at all. It's a proper noun. It's a title. And some English translations try to maintain this proper noun. They try to maintain this title by not translating the Greek, work at, Greek word at all, but simply referring to them how they refer in the original as magi. And perhaps that is the most proper way we should refer to them, because that is the way they were known at this time in history. As they went into the city of Jerusalem, it would have been known that magi 
have come. But that really only creates another question instead of answering it, doesn't it? What is a magi? Well, to some degree, we can't make too many exact statements because Matthew himself doesn't provide us with detail. But what that means is that Matthew assumes we already know what a magi is. And in calling them magi from the east, it is almost certain that Matthew is trying to evoke a memory in us from the Old Testament. It is an almost certainty that these are magi who have come from Persia and perhaps even the city of Babylon itself. A Babylonian magi was a sage and a priest. A Babylonian magi was someone who carried out official cult practices in the land of Babylon. They were priests and servants of the Babylonian god Marduk, whom we encountered in the book of Ezekiel, figured as a serpent with legs. We get our English word magic from this ancient word magi, and this is because magi were court magicians. In fact, perhaps the most natural translation of magi for us is simply magician. In Babylon and other eastern countries in the ancient world, magi were experts in astrology. That is, the spiritual study and interpretation of the stars. They would study the stars, and they would make predictions about future events uh, because of the stars. And we know this because Ma Babylonian magi have appeared in scripture before. They've appeared in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, in King Nebuchadnezzar's court, frequently. But one place where we see them is in Daniel chapter 1, verse 20, where the wisdom of Daniel is shown to outshine the wisdom of the Magi. Daniel chapter 1, verse 20 reads, And in every matter of wisdom and in understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all of the Magi and the enchanters who were in his kingdom. And indeed, this context fits well with the Magi of our text. For they learn that the king of the Jews was born because they observed his star when it arose. Perhaps the most important point that we can make about these magi from Babylon is that when they saw this star, when their journey began, they were most certainly, without a doubt, pagans. Likely court magicians who served Babylonian royalty, much like King Nebuchadnezzar of old, soothsayers dream interpreters, not at all unlike the sorcerers in the book of Exodus who attended to Pharaoh and were capable of mimicking the miracles performed at the hand of Moses. And so as we see Magi travel into the city of Jerusalem requesting that they might know where the king of the Jews is born so that they might worship him, well, as, as, as readers of the Gospel of Matthew now, with this context in our minds, this story of the Magi is shocking. The story of the Magi is the greatest of surprise because here we have the chief priests of Babylon coming to worship Christ. And here we have the chief priests of Israel refusing to attend his birth. God in his sovereignty is at work among the hearts of these magi, in the hearts of these the least likely worshipers of Jesus. John Calvin, commenting on this Christmas story, notes that yes, it may indeed have been a star that the magi followed, but it was the Holy Spirit of God who was guiding them in their hearts. For they were not only coming to pay homage to the birth of a human king, but they knew that the king whom they had traveled across the desert to see was one who was worthy of worship. And the word that they themselves use in their own mouths when they speak to Herod attest to this. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. And it is indeed the word for worship. It can mean nothing else. The Magi have not come to pay human reverence to a human king. The Magi have not come to honor some hero who is born in history. The Magi have come because they know that one worthy of worship, one worthy of them bowing and opening up their treasures and giving everything that they possess, this one has been born. 
That's the distinction that Calvin helpfully makes for us. A star may have announced to them that a king was born, but it was the Holy Spirit who told them that that king was worthy of worship. So then, for these magi who have come from the east, this is far more than a geographical journey for them. This is a spiritual journey. This is a journey of faith. God has called them physically out of the land of Babylon, and he has called them spiritually out of the land of Babylon as well. And their journey ends worshiping Jesus. And so, here, in this story of the Magi, we don't just have a, a, happy, a, a, a happy story that decorates our trees or helps us sing. We have here the fulfillment of that ancient promise of Genesis 3.15. God has sent into the very heart of Babylon itself. He has called the priests of Babylon. He has converted them, and he has made them worshipers of Christ. The weight of the sun's heel is already on the skull of the serpent. There have been fewer examples throughout the history of redemption to exemplify the wickedness of the serpent than the nation Babylon. In fact, Babylon remains the representative of the serpent even into the book of Revelation. And again, in Ezekiel, we saw what their chief god Marduk looked like, a snake with legs, which certainly should bring our minds to Genesis. But here God has reached into that city. God has reached into Babylon, and he has found these priests of the serpent. He has found these pagan magicians, and he's called them out of darkness. And he's brought them into the kingdom of his own marvelous light by bringing them to Jesus. Babylon has come to Jerusalem to worship Christ. This is why, of all men, God brought these Babylonian magi to come and worship Christ, to show what kind of savior has been born in Jerusalem, a savior of the nations, a savior of Jew and Gentile alike, a savior who leaves the 99 to find the one, a savior who goes into the darkness to bring uh, his people into the light. But this was also a condemnation to Israel, that the Messiah should be recognized by chiefs, chief priests of Marduk but not recognized by chief priests of Israel. And so that brings us to our second point, the response of the king, which contains within it the response of the entire Old Testament church. Verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And he assembled the chief priests and the scribes of the people, and he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. <clears throat> when these magi arrive in Jerusalem, they ask where this king, worthy of worship, is to be found. For them, this was the most obvious question to ask, and it should have been the most obvious question to answer. If they, men from a far off country, knew that God made flesh had been born in Israel, should not all of Jerusalem know it? No doubt we would imagine that as the Magi enter the gates of the city, in their minds they likely ex expected a celebration. They likely ex expected festivals. They likely expected worship and, and sacrifices and incense and the people of God rejoicing with such great joy for God himself has come. But in, but in, the, in Israel, the king, Herod, didn't even know it happened. In fact... In hearing the Magi inquire after Jesus, Herod and Jerusalem do not rejoice. They're troubled. It makes them nervous. And so Herod assembles the religious leaders of Jerusalem in order to get to the bottom of what's going on. He asks them, where are we supposed to look for this newborn king? Now let's stop there and notice how wrong this is. The king of Israel knows God's word so poorly that he does not even know the prophecy of the birthplace of the Messiah. And so he asks the chief priests and the scribes where the Messiah is to be born. And, and let's remember, by the way, that the uh, law of God requires that every king should write out a copy of the whole law by hand. So certainly, if Herod does not know where the Messiah is to be born, he has not done this. But the chief priests and the scribes answer immediately. They know exactly what God's word has to say on the issue. 
And so they give him a, an answer that's a blend of two quotes from Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and from 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 2. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Well, certainly in one sense, this is exactly what Herod was asking for. He wanted to know where Christ was to be born, and he was told. But in a very real sense, this is the last thing that King Herod wants to hear. That in Bethlehem, a ruler is to be born who is great among rulers. What Herod has just heard is that a child has been born who's going to take his place. Herod had no concern for saving his soul, but he had great concern for saving his throne. This confirms his worst fear. Not only is a king to be born, but a king of kings, one to whom even he must bow. Now there's a comparison taking place here in Matthew that we need to take notice of. Perhaps you are already starting to see it. On the one hand, here we have this group of pagan magicians, servants of Marduk, who had no direct access to God's word, no access to preaching, no access to prophecy, but when the birth of Christ is revealed to them, they leave Babylon. They travel across the desert and they seek him to worship him. But the king of Israel, the chief priests and the scribes who do have access to the word of God, in fact, who know it so well that they can quote it by memory, how do they respond? Well, they don't. Pagans from the east recognize who Jesus is. The chief priests do not. Let's just put it simply. Gentiles have come to worship the king of the Jews, and the sons of Abraham will not recognize him. Herod continues in our story, in fact, by plotting against Jesus. Verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent, to them, and he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Herod sends the Magi here on, a, on an informa information gathering mission. Uh, he wants them to come back and say, here's the exact address where you can find the child. But it is not as he says. Herod has no interest in worshiping Christ. This was an outright lie. And the Magi themselves would be warned in a dream not to give this information to Herod. For in verse 14, we learn what Herod's true intention is. Not to worship Jesus, but to destroy him. The serpent is not pleased that his kingdom is being plundered. The serpent is not pleased that the son of promise has been born. The serpent is not pleased that that weight of the Messiah's heel is already firm against his skull. As we see in imagery in Revelation chapter 12, the dragon's jaws are opening up wide to consume the woman and the child. And indeed, in Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, the serpent strikes as Herod puts every child in all of Bethlehem to the sword in hopes that one of them might be Jesus. The response of Herod and the response of the priests and the scribes show us where the hearts of God's people were on Christmas morning. They had God's word, but they would not hear it. And all throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, the religious leadership of Jerusalem would plot against him, denounce him, and ultimately crucify him. How they treat Jesus on Christmas tells us how they will treat Jesus on Good Friday, hating him and seeking his death. But with the arrival of Jesus Christ, no matter how hard the serpent may try and rage, God is already harvesting a first fruit of believers, even from Babylon. God is declaring victory before the battle is even joined. And in this we see our third and final point, the giving of gifts. Verse 9. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them 
until it came to rest over the place where the child was. After leaving the king, the Magi continued their search for Jesus. And just as they had been led from their homeland in the east, so now the star reappears to them in order to guide them to the child, to guide them to Christ. They were told that Jesus was in Bethlehem. But that narrows it down very little. That helps them very little. That, there is no guide given to them by Herod. No priest attends them on their way. They are given no help other than, here's the city, go figure it out by yourself. To put it simply, the church in Jerusalem had no real interest in helping these men worship Christ. So the star was their only means of finding it. And it's difficult to understand exactly what it means when the text says that the star moved and went before them until it came to rest over the child. But what we can gather from this is that this was no natural event in the heavens. This star was a supernatural event caused directly by God in order to lead them to Christ. God was determined to bring these men to Jesus even if the chief priests were not. And notice the reaction of the Magi when at long last that star appears and does lead them to Jesus. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. The star was leading them to Christ. That's all they wanted. In the original here, Matthew goes to great lengths. He uses four different words to tell us exactly how joyful the Magi were when they saw the star that led them to Christ. Literally, they rejoiced with a very joyful rejoicing. They were overcome with happiness to have found the Christ whom they have sought. And this joy bubbles up in them and leads to the only proper response to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They fell down and worshipped him. Verse 11, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And a part of their worship is giving gifts. In verse 11, it says that they opened up their treasures. They, everything that they brought with them, they did not bring with them for a comfortable, lavish journey. What they brought, they brought to lay down at Jesus' feet. These men are not kings, but what crowns they may possess, they cast at Jesus' feet willingly. Verse 11, it says, they offered him gifts. This, my friends, is the language of temple worship. We could translate it, they offered him offerings. The same language that is used of priests when they bring sacrifices and offerings to God inside of the temple. And that is what is going on here. These men recognize the king. These men recognize the temple of flesh. These men recognize their God. And the offerings that they bring reveal the identity of who this child is. They bring him gold. Gold is a gift that you give to kings. In fact, gold is actually a gift of tribute that you bring to a king who has conquered you. When a new king comes in and conquers your country, you offer gold as a sign of submission. These magi offer gold to Jesus, this king who has conquered their hearts. They are giving their hearts in submission to Jesus. They bring him frankincense, which is a type of incense that was commonly used in the temple. A, uh, a type of incense very frequently used by priests. We read in the Old Testament of fragrant offerings rising to the Lord's nostrils, and it was oftentimes frankincense that carried to the Lord that pleasing aroma. These men recognize a priest, and so they are giving him priestly equipment so that he may grow and carry out his ministry. And lastly, they give him myrrh. Now, myrrh is a very interesting gift for these men to offer. It is fitting to give a king gold. It is fitting to give a priest uh, frankincense and priestly uh, vestments. And no doubt when they offered gold and when they offered frankincense, Mary, who we know was present, was blessed by these gifts given to her son. But when they gave him myrrh, we can imagine that she was deeply troubled. 
We can imagine, or we can remember the word of prophecy that was spoken over her. The sword will pierce your heart also. You see, myrrh was an embalming oil. Or in other words, myrrh is something you placed upon dead bodies before burying them in order to cover up the smell of death and decay. Let's think of it this way. What mother would feel comforted on her infant son's first birthday if someone wheeled into the hospital an adult-sized coffin and said, he'll need this sooner than later? The gift of myrrh, even here, at the story of his birth is a proclamation of his death. The gift of myrrh preaches the cross that this son will carry up onto the hill, the cross upon which he will die, the cross by which he will crush the head of the serpent forever. Myrrh preaches the cross, and the cross preaches the empty tomb, by which wherein this son will rise, victorious from the grave, securing everlasting life, not everlasting death, for all of those who will place their faith in him. In this gift of myrrh, we are rem reminded that on Christmas morning, dear Christian, do not forget to celebrate the truth of Easter. They, these pagans, uh, born from a faraway land, God has brought them to his Christ, and he has given them an understanding of the cross. He has given them an understanding of the gospel. God has brought them here to worship at the feet of Jesus. And so as we come to the end of this passage on this Christmas morning, there are a number of things for us to take home with. First, we see the great mercy of God that he is calling people from all corners of the world to come and worship Jesus. Indeed, the Christmas story for the church ought to be a call to missions, to bring the gospel to the nations because Jesus is bringing the nations to himself. And if you're hearing these words today, whether you're uh, here in person or hearing it over digital means, and, and if you're only listening, if you're only here, in order to honor some Christmas tradition, know that just as the star led the Magi to Christ, so now the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of the word, is leading you today to Christ. Place your faith in him, even as these wise men did, and receive of the fullness of the promise that God has made in Jesus from ancient of days that you, yes, you, hearing these words, are set free from your guilt. You are set free from your shame. And my friend, you are set free from death itself. That is what this child has been born to accomplish. That is what this child is born to secure your everlasting life, your inheritance amongst the saints in light, the manger, the incarnation. This is the gospel. And in this is the cross. And lastly, ultimately, finally, the true point of application of this story, the true point of application of the Christmas story at all is this. Worship him with exceedingly great joy. The gospel is glad tidings to you. Unto you has been born a shepherd. Unto you has been born one who delivers you from every one of your sins, past, present, and future. Unto you has been born one who grants you everlasting life. Bring him your gold. That is to say, honor him as your king and value nothing in this world more highly than the glory of Christ. The wise men may have given Christ gold, but what Christ gave them was far, far more valuable. Bring him your frankincense. That is to say, trust that he is the true priest who accomplishes the true function of a priest, day and night interceding on your behalf by your name to God the Father. And yes, bring him your myrrh. That is to say, place your faith in his life, his death, and his resurrection. And the promise of Christmas is that you shall live. This is the gift of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the gift of Christmas. Amen. Amen. Let us pray.
our great God, our great promise keeper. Indeed, O oh Lord, in the earliest of days you made a promise, and that promise was of a son. A son who would be born in the loneliness of the manger. A son whose birth would itself be miraculous, born of a virgin, Emmanuel, God with us. And at his birth, we see that the serpent rages. And Lord, the serpent has not ceased to rage since the Christ has been born. But we know that the manger itself preaches the cross, and at the cross, the serpent's head was crushed once and for all, and the damage he does, he does now as one dead. But Lord, you have granted us in this same son, not death, but life, not guilt, but forgiveness, not shame, but honor. Oh Lord, you are the one who has decked us with so many good gifts. You are the one who has come, who has given us every treasure. Indeed, it is Jesus who has come and opened up his treasures and given to us everything in there that can be found. And so, Lord, we pray that as we prepare to leave this place, as we go to keep our Christmas traditions, whether we go to be with family, whether we go to eat, whether we go to sing, whether we go to rest, whether today by itself is a day of cheer or whether this day is a day that is difficult in the souls of those who suffer, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would be present with us in the gospel. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would be able to turn away from the lights that shine on our tree, Lord, that we would be able to turn away from the burdens that weigh down on our hearts and we would be able to turn to Christ and that we would fall down and worship him, the one who has secured for us life everlasting. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, this Christmas